Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. No rush to cut. More Fed officials signal a delay to U.S. rate cuts. Cleveland's Loretta Mester wants to see more data, while Governor Bowman warns progress on inflation may have stalled. BOE Governor, meanwhile, Andrew Bailey, says the UK is facing less inflation risk than the US, opening up the prospect of cutting rates before the Fed. Plus, chips in focus, TSMC, the world's biggest semiconductor maker, set to report earnings this hour, a day after disappointment from AS. ML. On the earnings front, Nokia dropping right now, the tele- telecom equipment maker, of course. So we'll bring you those lines with a focus on sales. It's expected to have been a challenging quarter. The first quarter, net sales coming in, though, slightly below the estimates for Nokia. 4.67 billion euros, so essentially 4.7 billion euros in terms of net sales for the first quarter, below the estimates of just shy of 5 billion euros. Here's the redhead now for Nokia. They still see their full year adjusted operating profit of between 2.3 billion to 2.9 billion. So they are holding their view in terms of full year adjusted operating profit. We know there has been pretty solid weakness around the demand, particularly for 5G telecom kit from some of the telecom equipment providers or telecom operators, I should say. And that has been a challenge for both Nokia and Ericsson. We continue to look for details around a patent dispute with some of the Chinese smartphone makers as well. But the redhead, they are maintaining Nokia, their full year adjusted operating profit forecast despite that challenging environment. Telco spending around 5G, we know, uh, has been softer than many in this space had hoped. Let's check these markets now more broadly on a day, of course, when we look at US futures once again pointing in the green. But we've seen that reversal before. Instead, we've seen four straight days of losses across US stocks. Today, though, futures pointing higher as investors continue to grapple with the debate around just how long these rates are going to have to be held higher as we continue to, of course, feed in the commentary from Fed officials. Currently, U.S. futures, S&P E-minis are pointing to gains of three-tenths of a percent. Again, you are about four percent below now on the S&P, those record highs that were notched earlier in the year. The FTSE 100 currently looking at gains of two-tenths of a percent. Again, the Andrew uh, Bailey, the BOE governor, of course, seeming to be uh, relatively relaxed about the higher than the expected CPI print that we got out of the U.K. yesterday. NASDAQ futures pointing high by three-tenths of a percent. We saw a big sell-off from some of the mega-cap tech stocks yesterday weighing on the NASDAQ with NVIDIA uh, dropping as well and weighing on the Nasdaq. European futures currently unchanged. Let's flip the board and look cross asset. There was a move as well into treasuries. They were bid yesterday, dip buying arguably given the run up in yields we see and have been seeing in the last few days. Yesterday though yields dropping about eight basis points on the benchmark 10 year. You're currently looking at the US 10 year at 457. A little bit of money continuing to move in there. Yields down a little under two basis points. The Bloomberg dollar index a little softer as well. The intervention story is in focus for us today. Arguably, the U.S. Treasury Secretary possibly giving the green light to the likes of Japan and South Korea to intervene in their currencies. I put a question mark around that. But nonetheless, the Bloomberg dollar index is off by about a tenth of a percent in the session. Keeping an eye on Brent, of course, given the geopolitics, given more sanctions potentially coming through for the likes of Iran and the change in dynamic around Venezuela. $87 a barrel on Brent currently just up two tenths of a percent. Inventories in the U.S. vote in focus as well. They have risen. Gold, 2,375, up six tenths of a percent. Let's cross over to Asia, where Avril Hong is standing by in Singapore for a check on the markets there. Avril, what are you looking at? We're looking at that sense of calm returning to Asia markets, whether you're talking about stocks, bonds or currencies. And this is thanks to authorities' verbal intervention that's helping to boost confidence in financial markets in the region. I'll dig into the details a bit further and the impact on the currencies market in just a bit. But we can see also how the Asia stock gauge is snapping a succession losing streak today. It's headed for its best day in a month. And in South Korea and Australia, worth highlighting, well, we're seeing the materials index, for example, the stocks there, they are outperforming. And this is against the backdrop of the U.S. president calling for higher tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminium. But really, the sector we're really focusing on is the chip-related stocks. As TSMC's earnings come out later today, we're watching out for the CapEx plans from the world's largest chip foundry at a time where the U.S. chip gauge as well as NVIDIA have fallen into correction. And there is a 
sense of how TSMC could potentially boost the South Korean and the Taiwanese stock benchmarks. These are, of course, the tech-rich gauges. And our M Life strategist Mark Cranfield has pointed out that back in January, when TSMC's quarterly earnings dropped, that actually coincided with a bullish turning point for both these indices. I'll flip the board. Let's take a look at how currencies are faring today. As I say, that sense of calm is returning. That reprieve, thanks to jawboning, we got the US, Japan, South Korea joint statement that's spurring intervention bets. We got PBOC coming through with a statement on WeChat uh, that is trying to prevent the risk of overshooting from the exchange rate. But you got to wonder how long all this is going to last, especially with the Fed narrative that's in play, higher US yields potentially as well as a supported greenback. Tom? Hey, Rahong in Singapore. Thank you very much indeed. And we unpack that part of the story in more detail now with the Fed's latest Beige Book survey suggesting that the U.S. economy has expanded slightly since late February. And firms are reporting great difficulty in passing on higher costs. Fed Governor Michelle Bowman, meanwhile, saying progress on inflation has slowed and perhaps even stalled. What we've seen over the past first few months of, um, of 2024, anyway, is that inflation, progress on inflation has slowed. And, and I expect maybe it's even stalled at this point. OK, let's bring in Mary Nicola now from Bloomberg MLive's team, Bloomberg's MLive team, uh, for the kind of wrap and the market reaction to the commentary we'll be getting from these Fed officials. Mary, where do we stand then? Do we have clarity on where the Fed is and how the markets are thinking about the sequencing going forward? Yeah, we know from not only from Michelle Bauman and from Loretta Mester that there is going to be delay in cuts, but also what we heard from Jerome Powell this week also just solidified that. The fact that the Fed is likely to be delayed, that they had three months of data showing that there was a, um, that there was a pullback in inflation in terms of the, it, there wasn't that much progress on inflation as much as they had expected, and undoing what we saw at the start, at the, at the end of last year. So now the Fed has to wait for another another trend, another trend that's going to come through to show that there's disinflationary pressures coming. And so at the at the end of the day, they're going to have to delay their their the start of their easing cycle. Um, so higher for longer persists, and dollar strength as a result also persists. Yeah, and the divergence that we're getting, at least on the rhetorical front, from the likes of Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England, and Jay Powell has been quite stark in the last few days. Mary, what, what do we know in terms of the health of the U.S. economy? The Fed Beige Book giving a little bit more detail, the 12 districts they look at. Where does that leave our understanding of the U.S. economy? It's, it's, it's quite exceptional that we see that the U.S. data, after, one after the other, continues to prove U.S. Exceptionalism, exceptionalism. And that U.S. exceptionalism, coupled with uh, rate differentials, and as you mentioned, the comments from Andrew Bailey, and, and the fact that the ECB is likely to start cutting um, as soon as June. So there is that divergence. There is the divergence, whether it's on rates and whether it's on, on, on growth. And that is going to keep the dollar supported. And so Yes, you could have some sort of a reprieve. You could have some sort of resistance, especially with some of the comments coming out from the finance ministers and, and from uh, the, uh, the job owning that we've seen. But at the end of the day, the underlying narrative remains, and that's that U.S. growth remains exceptional. Rate, rate differentials uh, continue to widen in favor of the, of the dollar. So it's hard to see where, that, where, where the dollar, really the dollar declines coming through. OK, U.S. exceptionalism being, uh, being crystallised, it seems. Bloomberg's uh, Mary Nicola from MLive, the MLive team, with the analysis there. And what we've been hearing, of course, from Fed speakers and uh, the Fed Beige Book as well, what that tells us about the state of the U.S. economy and potentially where that Federal Reserve goes next. Thank you very much indeed. To geopolitics now, domestic politics tying into geopolitics in the U.S., where U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson is moving ahead with new assistance for both Ukraine and Israel. That's despite threats from Republican hardline to oust him. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Bruce Einhorn for the details. Uh, Bruce, what is Speaker Johnson's plan to get this age aid package passed? How likely is it? What is the resistance he's facing? Give us the update. Well, uh, Tom, this has been uh, uh, several months in the works. The Senate passed a package of $95 billion in aid to Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel, um, 
uh, back in February. Uh, since then, uh, the House hasn't done anything. Uh, uh, we now know that uh, Speaker Johnson is planning several votes uh, that would be uh, this weekend uh, that would divide the uh, Senate's package into different, uh, different votes. So there would be one vote for Ukraine aid, there would be one for Israel, there would be one for Taiwan. Uh, the thinking is that by splitting it up like this, uh, Speaker Johnson can get them all through. Uh, the Ukraine aid, by having one vote on that, you'd get more Democrats, even though he'd lose Republicans who are opposed to it. Uh, with the Israel vote, he would get more Republicans. He would lose Democrats who want to impose conditions on aid to Israel. Uh, the Taiwan one probably would sail through without much opposition from either side. There's uh, pretty uh, bipartisan agreement on the Taiwan part of it. Uh, uh, the speaker also is planning including one more vote that would uh, um, impose uh, further costs on Russia that would include uh, seizing assets uh, of Russia in order to defray some of the costs of this package. Uh, uh, if all mm. goes well, this would all happen this weekend, Tom. Uh, still a lot that could go wrong now between now and then. <laughs> Yeah, some potential pitfalls uh, in, in line for this bill uh, in, in the days ahead. Bruce, talk to us. Ukraine, of course, has been screaming out for aid. Why has it taken so long? Uh, well, there's been this long delay. President Biden initially proposed this back in October last year. Uh, uh, there was Republican opposition that quickly uh, uh, got together and, and effectively stalled everything because uh, uh, Republicans said that uh, they couldn't pass any sort of aid package without first addressing what they called the crisis at the southern border. Uh, there was a bipartisan deal that uh, senators worked out on that. That ended up collapsing after opposition from former President Trump as well as from Johnson. Uh, and so uh, since then, we've been in this stalemate position. Another thing that <coughs> Speaker Johnson has to consider is that uh, there's a rule in the House that all it takes is one person to propose a motion to vacate the chair, in other words, to unseat the speaker. Uh, and there have been uh, Republicans who have threatened to do that. Uh, most recently, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene has said that uh, she wants to have a vote to vacate the chair to get rid of Speaker Johnson. Uh, another Republican, Tom Massey from Kentucky, has said that he would support that. Uh, all, all they now need is one more because the Republican majority is so small in the House uh, that uh, uh, Speaker Johnson can't afford to lose another vote. Uh, if one more Republican says that if this aid package vote goes through, then they'll vote to get rid of him, then Speaker Johnson would depend on Democrats to keep his job. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of different factors in play. One other thing to keep mm. in mind is in addition to all this, uh, Johnson has said that there will be as part of this package uh, a vote from the House that would uh, condition some of this, this aid on uh, a TikTok bill that would force ByteDance to mm. sell TikTok in the U.S. That's something that the House has already voted on, the Senate has not voted on. Um, so uh, if that were to be in the, in the package, that could slow things down a lot, Tom. OK, Bruce Einhorn, thank you very much indeed. We'll continue to watch to see if they can get this bill across the line, of course. Thank you for the update. Let's give you a little clarity on what's coming up today. Some of the big topics and agenda items to focus in on. 7 a.m. UK time, uh, we're going to get new car registrations out of the EU, the 27 members of uh, the European Union. So a little bit of detail there in terms of the demand coming through for the auto market. 5 p.m. UK time, we're going to get L'Oreal sales as well. So within the retail slash luxury luxury and cosmetic space. That could be interesting, 5 p.m. UK time. And then U.S. earnings. We're going to get Netflix and Blackstone as well. So two, of course, very, very different businesses coming through with their earnings story later today. You can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can go to DAYB Go, of course, to check that out. Top items so far today. TikTok, and Bruce was talking about this, the potential uh, divestiture story as it gets tied into that bill for aid around Ukraine and Israel. So TikTok and the fortunes of the owner, ByteDance and Focus. Uh, Loretta Mester is going to be speaking, so further commentary on the state of the US economy and the expectations around rate cuts, of course, expected. And then UBS, one of the top corporate stories of the day for us. More job cuts, more than 100 job cuts. In fact, UBS said to be planning another round of 
job cuts as it continues to trim headcount following its rescue, of course, of Credit Suisse. Sources telling Bloomberg that they are also expected to affect more than 100 positions across its global investment bank in the coming weeks. Cuts also expected in its wealth management and markets unit. Sergio Amato, of course, the CEO of the company, has not detailed exactly how many job cuts will be coming through eventually and ultimately, but has said they're looking for $6 billion worth of cost savings. We keep across that story for you. Coming up, the US eyes new sanctions on Iranian oil. More details on that next. And what Israel is thinking about a potential response to that Iranian attack. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, U.S. House Republicans have included new sanctions on Iranian oil in a wider foreign aid package for Israel and Ukraine, as we were discussing before the break. Joining us now for the analysis on the Iranian component of this story is Bloomberg's Patrick Sykes, who is in Istanbul. Patrick, thanks for joining us. It wasn't that long ago that U.S. enforcement efforts around Iranian sanctions were easing off a bit because they wanted to get more oil into the market. They wanted inflation down. That dynamic clearly has changed. What are the details around these proposals in this package and what could the consequences be? Morning, Tom. Yeah, I think it's interesting, actually, you know, introducing the sanctions and enforcing them may be two different dynamics, right? This, mm. there, there's a scenario where they could pass these sanctions and send the message that we're trying to restrict Iran's oil revenue uh, as a measure of support to Israel, but meanwhile, not actually enforce it all that strongly in the way that you described. We've seen recently and therefore keep oil flowing, keep prices as best they can relatively muted. Uh, but that's, I think, just one of yeah, a few measures we've seen overnight where the, the movement on the sanctions seems to be to expand them. Oil was one in the U EU as well. We also saw uh, some G7 countries apparently uh, considering sanctions on Iran's national airline, Iran Air. That also seems particularly uh, symbolic to me. You know, this, but we are seeing the scope widen mm. from the initial drone and missile program that followed the attack, which yep. was very directly to the nature of it, to Iran's uh, interests, income more broadly. And meanwhile, the extreme suffering, of course, of the people in Gaza continues. The UN looking at some attempts to alleviate that. What are the details there, Patrick? Yeah, it was around 2.5 billion uh, they're seeking uh, dollars. That is, of course, a big number, and it's a 10 times increase of what they were seeking way back six months ago at the start of the war. But it is still short of, I think, around the, the 5 billion that they were, 4 billion perhaps, they were seeking in total. And they're also making very clear that, that what they can actually deliver is very limited limited by the operational constraints on the ground. I think to have a real substantive impact, you've not only got to overcome the sort of current hurdles of getting aid in, uh, getting those backlogs cleared, and then distributing it once you're inside Gaza. But more broadly, you know, distributing this in a war zone is an operational nightmare, and it's only really a ceasefire I think, that's going to see those increasingly high numbers translate into uh, proportionally effective humanitarian responses. Yeah, and Israel continuing to face criticism, of course, from a number of different parties, international aid groups, of course, and leaders around the world for what they describe as the holdups that Israel's putting in place around, around some of that aid. Of course, Israel pushes back on that narrative, but nonetheless, the critique is certainly uh, there. Patrick Sykes in Istanbul, thank you very much indeed on the latest in terms of trying to get that much-needed aid into Gaza and the potential Iranian sanctions as well folded in to that package that's working its way through the U.S. Senate as we speak. Coming up, it's Zimbabwe's sixth attempt at establishing a functioning local currency after years of hyper inflation. We're going to hear exclusively from the country's finance minister. We're going to pivot to a fascinating story around Zimbabwe and a change around the currency. The conversation is next. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, Zimbabwe's finance minister says the country's new currency, backed by bullion and foreign reserves, is an important milestone for the country. He spoke to us exclusively about how the ZIG, short for Zimbabwe Gold, can face down those inflationary pressures. We all thought maybe the Federal Reserve was going to move and, uh, and, and cut, cut interest rates, but, but they haven't. But that, that, that's, that's the way it is. They are also worried about uh, inflation risks in the U.S. You are right, this does put pressure on currencies around the world in emerging markets. But ours, the ZIG, is linked to, to, to gold. Uh, and we are right that, you know, there's always some deflationary risk, uh, you know, uh, out there. Uh, and we're, we're alive to that. But we don't see that being an issue because for us, the quest has been to restore stability as the first order of business, but also to contain inflation as the first order of, of, of business. So maybe a bit of deflation is not necessarily a bad idea as, well as, to, as a way of re-anchoring expectations on price movement into the future. Could you give us an update about your efforts to resolve that situation, the $6.7 billion in arrears that Zimbabwe does owe to outsiders? You're right, Matthew, that the, the arrears, debt arrears, uh, and albatross around the Zimbabwe economy, we could be growing faster, looking at the growth of 6.8% on average over the last three years. Imagine if we didn't have the albatross of the debt, that growth could be higher, could be averaging 8%. So it's an issue that we need to deal with. We'll put a process in place where uh, uh, we're working with the, the creditors in the first place, the, the 17 Paris Club creditors, and also bilateral creditors with the World Bank, the IMF, the African Development Bank. We have a champion in the form of President Adesina of the African Development Bank. We have a high-level facilitator, the former president of Mozambique, and they're all helping us to close the gap between Zimbabwe as a debtor with, the, with all the, the creditors. One thing that I wanted to ask you was, why was this currency introduced by, via a statutory instrument, which is, I guess you can say, a legal instrument, almost like a subsidiary um, law, though it's not a law, it, what, it's not a bill that went through parliament that was approved by lawmakers. Why not introduce the currency by introducing a bill to parliament, let lawmakers debate it, it becomes an act, and then... An, they... or, or I, 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 imagine you have a currency volatility and a weakening a domestic currency, and then you're having this long debate in parliament about the next currency and so forth, it will be a mess. You, you can never do it like that. The way to do it is to do it the way we did it, which is you need a structural instrument that allows you to do things quickly, efficiently, without revealing too much information, including how the currency is priced. So, so the, having a structural, using a structural instrument is actually a clever way to do it. And then once that is done, the currency is introduced, you can then always go back to, to Parliament to then endorse that through a normal bill or the Finance Act in, 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 in our case. So, so this is the, it's a better way to do it. OK, that was Zimbabwe's finance minister speaking to Bloomberg's Matthew Hill in Washington on the new currency, the ZIG, and some of their debt challenges as well. Let's check in on these markets. Commodities getting a bit of a lift this morning. The big story, of course, as you saw, 3% drop in oil yesterday, reversing but only at the margins today. Brent at $87.55, up 3 tenths percent. And gold continuing to get a lift, up 6 tenths of a percent at 2,376 per troy ounce. That hedging mechanism, the risk-off mechanism, or at least the hedge that it provides, gold seem, seemingly still an appetite there. We continue to look at European futures, of course, which are looking a little flat, Currently just gains of about a tenth of percent. U.S. futures pointing high by three tenths of a percent. Still ahead, we are counting down to the TSMC results, of course, what it tells us about the demand for AI chips. Will they see the pickup that many expect? Those numbers expected to cross in the next few minutes. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. No rush to cut. More Fed officials signal a delay to U.S. rate cuts. Cleveland's Loretta Mester wants to see more data, while Governor Bowman warns progress on inflation may have stalled. BUE Governor Andrew Bailey, meanwhile, says the U.K. is facing less inflation risk than the U.S., opening up the prospect of cutting rates before 
the Fed. Plus, chips in focus. Earnings for TSMC crossing right now. I'll bring you the top lines. The first quarter net income for the world's biggest chip maker coming in with a beat. 225.5 billion Taiwanese dollars. The estimates had been for 214. So it's a beat in terms of net income. Gross margin as well coming in slightly above the estimates. 53.1%. The estimates had been for 53% in terms of gross margin for the first quarter. We know that CapEx is really crucial for the analysts watching this stock. So we look for the details on that. Quarterly profit of 6.97 billion US dollars. That's the equivalent when you do the FX conversion. That is a beat on estimates. Again, the gross margin also coming in higher, marginally 53.1%. The smartphone part of the business, we know that's a little bit cloudy, but it's the AI demand that was expected to have lifted these results. It seems like that's what's come through. We wait for more details, of course, from TSMC, making the key producer, of course, in terms of the chips for the likes of Apple. Apple and NVIDIA. CapEx, here we go, reaching 5.77 billion US dollars in the first quarter. We want the forecasts around CapEx. The latest estimates had been that CapEx for the year would be around 29 billion US dollars. If it comes in line with that or above, you could see a loft lift to this stock. The CapEx coming in then. For the first quarter, 5.77 billion US dollars in the first quarter. Again, net income for TSMC in the first quarter, beating estimates. We continue to look ahead to the forecast and see if they get upgraded or adjusted around that CapEx spend because that tells us so much about the demand picture, of course, for their customers like NVIDIA and Apple. So some of the key lines crossing for TSMC. We're going to break this story down for you in more detail in the next couple of minutes. It's a major story for us, of course, to read across the broader chip space. We had ASML dragging on some semiconductors yesterday with softer demand for some of their high-end ultraviolet lithography machines. That demand a little bit softer in terms of the orders being put through by the likes of TSMC. Nonetheless, the AI demand seems to be lifting this company, at least for now, even as the smartphone business licks a little bit more murky. Let's check in on these markets where, of course, you've had four straight days of losses across U.S. stocks. Futures, though, turning a little round a bit, uh, suggesting that maybe there's some upside that comes through for the U.S. markets. Let's see if that holds, though, because that's the narrative that we've seen in the last few days, and then it's adjusted towards the middle of the day. European futures point in modest gains of about a tenth of a percent. FTSE 100 futures pointing to gains of 25 points. And S&P E-mini still below that 5,100 line, but looking to gains of three tenths of a percent again after four straight days of losses. And it was NVIDIA, in fact, that weighed on the Nasdaq yesterday. The Nasdaq, though, today pointed to gains of around 89 points, up five tenths of a percent. Let's flip the boards, look cross asset, because you did see a bid actually for Treasuries yesterday after the sell-off that we've seen in the last few days. Yields coming down about eight basis points on the benchmark 10-year. Currently, you're seeing a move lower by an additional two basis points, 456, buying the dip, it seems, on U.S. Treasuries. The Bloomberg dollar index, a little softer as well. So giving some reprieve to Asian FX so far in this session. The intervention story remains in focus, of course. Bloomberg dollar index down a tenth of percent. Brent is up four tenths of percent, but after a drop of three percent yesterday, U.S. inventories back to levels we haven't seen since June. Gold, 2,376, up seven tenths of a percent. Let's get the details, the analysis then, on the FX story right now. The yen gaining against the dollar then following a joint statement from both the U.S., Japan and South Korea, noting, quote, serious concerns about the depreciation of the two Asian currencies. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Mark Cranfield from our MLive team. Mark, what is the message to FX traders from G7 speakers? Was Janet Yellen really giving them the green light over in Japan and South Korea to intervene in their currencies? Yeah, basically, if you're, they're telling traders, if you're long US dollars, your time is running out. This wonderful mm. trend that we've been seeing for, for several months, where dollar strength against everything, really, not just you know, major currencies, Asian currencies, Latin America, wherever you look, the dollar's been on the tear, obviously supported by high yields, good, strong economic data out of the United States. But clearly, there are several countries getting very uncomfortable with what that dollar strength is doing to their currencies. And we had a rare joint statement today from Janet Yellen and the finance ministers of South Korea and Japan acknowledging that people are getting a bit concerned about the weakness in these currencies. So it doesn't mean to say that the United States is going to support intervention directly, but they are probably saying, look, if you want to go ahead and give your currency some specific support, we are not going to get in the way and you effectively you have our green light. Doesn't mean to say it's going to happen immediately. But clearly, we're getting closer to the point where these currencies have fallen a long way. 
and the, those are respective countries, particularly South Korea and Japan, but it applies to many other places. We've seen it in Asia, we've seen it in Latin America, even to some extent with the euro as well. These currencies have fallen a long way, and clearly it's about time that there was some stability. So it's the first warning shot to foreign exchange traders. We've seen a bit of a pullback already. It's probably got a little bit further to go. In terms of what it means Globally, it's obviously giving a bit of a lift to the mood in Asian equities and, and equities in general. So we're probably going to see a decent day because the risk mood can calm down and now people can go back to looking at the data. The rate differential, as you well know, Mark, remains extreme, of course, particularly in terms of the Fed and the BOJ. And some would argue that's going to remain a challenge uh, to kind of any, any intervention. Talk to us about the Fed rate pricing, particularly given the, least, the, the most recent commentary you've been hearing from the likes of Michelle Bowman, who says inflation may have stalled. Yes, I mean, you're still getting slightly mixed messages from the Federal Reserve, but Jerome Powell has also spoken this week and said he's in no rush. Other Fed members have said the same thing. Even Ms. Bowman really has indicated they've got, they can take their time. The, the data is supporting a very strong US economy. Jobs growth is very strong as well. Inflation is still a bit too high. Everything points to the fact that the, the data is telling the Fed that there's no need to, to take it too quickly. Of course, the last thing they would want to do is to get themselves in a position where they did an early rate cut and then had to go backwards. They had to unwind it because inflation surprised them later in the year. Better for them just to hold where they are and see how the data plays out. Now, in terms of what that means for, for other risk assets, it probably means that the US Treasury market continues to be in a bit of a range. Yields will probably don't really go outside the kind of numbers that we've seen in the first quarter or so of this year. But it's probably supportive for the equity market. And then, of course, you've got the US dollar. But that will also be affected by what happens on the flip side. Bank of Japan meeting next week is a very big one. Because although the consensus in the poll that just came out is that the Bank of Japan will not change interest rates, there is certainly a risk of surprise because Governor Ueda has repeated that the yen plays into the inflation picture in Japan. The yen is too weak. And he certainly might want to respond and show that he's getting on top of that as well. OK, always valuable analysis from Mark Cranfield from Bloomberg's Markets Live team. Mark, thank you very much indeed. We've just had numbers going back to the corporate earnings space then, from the macro uh, to the micro around the corporate space. The world's biggest chip maker, of course, TSMC, reporting a beat on first quarter net income in terms is the first profit rise, in fact, in, in a year for TSMC. Let's bring in our senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence then to break down the numbers we've seen from TSMC. Robert Lee, who's standing by for us in Hong Kong. Robert, what stands out to you at this point? OK, uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, you've already run through the numbers. So as you've said, uh, these seem on the face of it a decent beat, uh, roughly just under 5% beat at the net income level, roughly around 1% beat at the operating level. Um, so that will give the market some encouragement that the, the company's returning to growth after a somewhat difficult 2023. However, there are some potential question marks on the horizon. I think yourself and your viewers are well aware about the weakness that Apple is seeing within the China smartphone business at the moment. And by our estimations, Apple accounts for between 20 to 25 percent of TSMC's revenue. That's one thing. And very quickly, overnight, we saw the, uh, or from an Asian perspective, we saw ASML results. They were great, but their order intake on these key, you know, bleeding edge EUV machines was weakened and expected. I think that has no impact on TSMC for the next couple of quarters, but it does raise a little question mark about the demand into the tail end of this year and into 2025. Uh, but the key thing for TSMC stock, as you said in your intro, is what's the CapEx outlook? We don't know that yet. We're here on the call later on. And more importantly, what's the guidance for the next quarter and the year as a whole? Again, we'll have to wait and see on that front, see what the management say. OK, so we looked in the near term in terms of the call and then you're pushing all the way out to 2025. Brilliant analysis, Rob. Give us a quick view, though, on the second quarter and how the rest of the year is, is shaping up for TSMC. Well, yeah, OK, apologies for the dull answer, but it's all AI, AI, AI and a bit of NVIDIA mixed in there. So I think the near term outlook does look good. But again, just taking a step back here, 14% um, or so of the company's revenue comes from the automotive sector. We've seen incremental weakness coming in on the EV side. So I think that's one thing people need to keep an eye on. Uh, smartphones, again, I've already mentioned about Apple, which is their largest single customer. So again, there are some question marks there. So I think the, if we're going to see incremental upside to earnings estimates and potentially the share price, 
the upside in AI needs to outweigh potential weakness elsewhere. One last thing, we, we had this unfortunate earthquake recently. Luckily, the loss of life was fairly minimal, but there was some disruption to TSMC's business. I think there's a question mark whether there is a near-term margin here into Q2. But again, we'll, we'll wait to see what the management have to say later on. OK, senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, Robert Lee, with the quick fire. An immediate take there on the numbers crossing in terms of the earnings from TSMC. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, Europe is watching as industrial policy in China and the U.S. threatens to leave the continent behind. That is the backdrop for the EU leaders meeting in Brussels today. They face, of course, tough decisions on keeping the region competitive. Will they move from rhetoric to policy implementation? Let's bring in Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, who's standing by for us at that meeting on the sidelines, going to be covering all of this for us in detail. Oli, alarm bells then ringing clearly in European capitals, European leaders, some of them wringing their hands yeah. about the lack of action. What have you been hearing? Yeah, well, listen, Tom, listen, the alarm bells are ringing, as you say, and it's a lot easier to impose tariffs on China than it is to deal with your own competitiveness. But at a certain point, the mirror, you need to look into it and decide what does Europe need to do in order to compete on the global stage with the United States and, yes, with China. And you think if you think you've done hear, hearing from Mario Draghi on Bloomberg Television, you are wrong because he is one of the authors of the reports that sort of try to il illustrate how Europe needs to stay competitive. And, you know, he's a man who chooses his words with grand deliberation, so maybe we should hear it from him because he put it very clearly and very succinctly. China, for example, is aiming to capture and internalize all parts of the supply chain in green and advanced technologies. The United States, for its part, are using large-scale industrial policy to attract high-value domestic manufacturing capacity within their borders. We are lacking a strategy for how to keep pace in an increasing cutthroat race. It requires us to act as a European Union in a way we never have before. So for Mr. Whatever It Takes, whatever it takes in Europe right now is radical political change. He closed that speech by saying there needs to be a reimagining of Europe that is on the same scale as basically the founding of the coal and steel union 70 years ago. Unfortunately for Europe, this is exactly the kind of thing that they're really bad at. Huge issue, very difficult political negotiations, and the urgency is not today, tomorrow. It's sort of the long-term obsolescence of this economy. So, Oli, what are the measures then the EU leaders are proposing, discussing to address some of those issues highlighted by Draghi? Yes. Yeah, so Draghi was one of the uh, is one of the authors of the competition report. The other is another former Italian prime minister, Enrico Letta, who put a 147 page, very detailed mar uh, uh, report about the single market and its future and really sort of highlighting a couple of things that need to happen. One, a stronger energy union within Europe, another sort of consolidation within the telecom sector. They were talking about there are 32 telecom companies across Europe and the United States. You have two. This breeds all kinds of inefficiencies um, within the market. And then, of course, the capital markets union, Tom, we've heard about this for a decade now. Does this sort of need for investment, does it, will it give the impetus to get these rules in place and get the political initiative there to get that capital flowing across Europe? And then, of course, the last one, defense spending and potentially the question of joint debt in order to finance it. Where is the money going to come from? They're really banking on these two things. But, Tom, all of this means one thing. That is a bigger Europe, a Europe that acts more like a nation rather than an assortment of nations, coming ahead of a European election where Euroscepticism is on the rise. OK, the monumental challenges facing the EU being outlined there. Some of the policy prescriptions potentially in focus. Bloomberg's Ollie Crook, thank you very much indeed with the detail there in terms of that EU leaders meeting. Ollie will be covering that for us throughout the day, of course. Switching focus, Berkshire Hathaway has priced more than 260 billion yen of bonds. 260 billion yen of bonds. It's Berkshire's largest yen debt deal since 2019 when it first began sales in the Japanese currency. Let's bring in the detail, get more, and bring in Bloomberg's Asia credit reporter, Aya Tomasawa, for the detail. Aya, why is this deal then from Berkshire Hathaway important? What was the focus? 
Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, it was uh, one of the you know, most focused um, deals in Japan because um, it's one of the first and then the biggest uh, bond deals from a foreign issuer uh, since the Bank of Japan ended the world's uh, last negative uh, yield policy uh, last, last month. So uh, it was being focused and then also um, how much um, it can um, attract demand from investors uh, would be also um, interesting because um, you know Warren Buffett um, has a history of investing in Japanese stocks and then um, especially uh, Japanese major Japanese trading houses so it has an implication significant implication to the stock market as well and Berkshire is, of course, a, a frequent issuer of, of yen bonds. Some may not be aware of that, but they are. Why, why would the U.S. company then raise bonds in, in the Japanese currency? Right. So, yes. Um, so uh, some uh, non-Japanese um, companies would... Uh, um raise uh, yen bonds for, you know, they have different reasons. But for Berkshire Hathaway, it has bought uh, Japanese uh, trading houses, uh, you know, shares uh, in the past. And then um, it said that it will, it wants to uh, buy up to 9.9 percent of um, trading companies stocks. So it still has uh, room to buy more. So, um, you know, people are expecting that uh, the company uh, will continue to buy uh, Japanese um, stocks, and then Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Warren Buffett said that you know it, you know he likes um, value shares, um, and value stocks in Japan could include um, other uh, sector shares like you know financials, you know banks, and then insurance companies, which got a boost today, so their uh, stock prices rose today. OK, so that's where they're going to be bringing the, fund, the funds to play, arguably, is in, is in Japanese stocks, Japanese equities, as they, as they have done in the past. And, and, and Warren Buffett's been quite clear about the prospects and the opportunities there. Um, what implication, II, does this have in other asset classes? So, yes. Uh, so credit market, uh, of course. Uh, so uh, in the past, uh, foreign issuers... Uh, you know, have been able to uh, raise uh, more than 100 billion yen uh, over the past year, especially. So that means that, um, you know, investors are, you know, looking for uh, attractive deals from non-Japanese issuers. And that's an implication to the credit market. But for the stock market, um, Warren Buffett um, has, uh, you know, helped uh, the equities market uh, to, you know, rise to all-time highs. Um, earlier this year. So, uh, you know, people are expecting that um, if, if the company announces a more uh, share buying uh, for Japanese companies, um, it has a significant um, impact to the equities market as well. OK, Bloomberg's Asia credit reporter, II Thomas Sawa, with that detail on the Berkshire Hathaway debt sale in Japan. Thank you very much indeed and the broader implications. Now for some of the other stories making the news this Thursday. Bloomberg has learned that Micron, the largest U.S. maker of computer memory chips, is poised to get 6.1 billion U.S. dollars in grants from the Commerce Department to help pay for domestic factory Projects, According to sources, Micron, like Intel and TSMC, will also accept loans as part of its award package. The plans are part of U.S. efforts to bring semiconductor production back to American soil. And Bloomberg understands Microsoft's $13 billion investment in OpenAI is set to avoid a formal investigation by European Union merger watchdogs. We're told the commission has decided that the tie-up doesn't merit a formal probe because it falls short of a takeover and that Microsoft doesn't control the direction of the infamous AI company. And the owner of Britain's Royal Mail has rejected a $3.1 billion Pound cash bid from Czech entrepreneur Daniel Kretinsky because it, quote, significantly undervalues the company. Shares in international distribution services surged 28% yesterday but remained well below the offer price. IDS says the approach doesn't reflect the prospects for the company under its new management team. There is plenty more coming up. We'll focus in on the inflation picture globally and give you a bit of detail around what's happening in the oil space as well. Stay with us this is Bloomberg.
what we've seen over the past first few months of, um, of 2024 anyway, is that inflation, progress on inflation has slowed. And, and I expect maybe it's even stalled at this point. Uh, we're in the position where we're seeing this process of disinflation. I expect that next month's number will show quite a strong drop because we have a particularly unique energy, household energy pricing system in the UK. OK, and that's one of the most interesting pieces of rhetoric that has formed over the last week. And it's backed as well by the data is the divergence that we're seeing now between what we're hearing from the likes of Andrew Bailey on the relatively benign picture, as he would characterize it around UK inflation versus US inflation. Over in the Eurozone, Christine Lagarde also suggesting that she's relatively comfortable, certainly not pushing back on the idea that June is almost essentially baked in in terms of the first cut from the ECB. Here's what's happening then in terms of that inflation move lower. The progress that's been made, given that run up that we saw during the pandemic, but where it stalls out. And I want to zero in to the end of this chart and the yellow line. That is US inflation versus headline inflation versus the white lines of the UK and the light blue of the Eurozone. And you can see that divergence. The U.S. inflation picture on the headline basis edging higher. The U.K., though, having stalled and flattened out, edging lower, 3.2 percent. Yes, it came in above those forecasts yesterday marginally. Doesn't seem like Andrew Bailey's overly concerned at this point. But this is the concern for the U.S., 3.5 percent level, and the fact that it seems to, as Bowman has said, has stalled out. But you are still below, above, of course, those targets for the central banks on all of these, ECB, BOE and Fed. But you can see now the divergence there in terms of the headline numbers, and that is feeling into what we're hearing from these Fed officials and BOE officials. Let's flip the board and quickly have a look at the oil story because of that. Of course, the energy component is there in the mix in terms of inflation. Looking a little bit more benign on the back of inventories building up in the US, highest levels since June. And of course, you have the inverse relationship between inventories and prices, and you're seeing that play out again, particularly yesterday with that 3% drop. Markets today is next. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 